This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Thanks so much for all of you coming out. We are thrilled to have a wonderful and diverse set of panelists here at UC San Diego this afternoon to have a discussion that I hope will be civil about civility, which is the ability to encounter people of disparate views and not disparage the people who hold them. We're gonna talk in this panel about the state of civility in American political life, at universities, in our media, online, and, and in our everyday conversations. We're, we're going to assess where we are in the grand historical sweep of American history and talk about where we are today. The good of civility, perhaps some of the things that may be wrong with civility and, and thinking hard about whether this concept is something that we always need to aspire to. And finally, we'll talk about if incivility is indeed a problem in American politics today, in American life, what we need to do about it and what can fruitfully move us forward. So we're thrilled to have a, a great panel. Let's start on the right with introductions. Uh, Robbie Boparai is the UC San Diego AS president and also is the co-leader of the uh, Association of All of the Student Body Presidents across the UCs in California. He's an advocate on campus for things such as uh, the prevention of sexual assault, on, on having student-led curriculum. Uh, he himself is an aspiring pre-med student who's a human biology and psychology major who still has some time to serve. So we're thrilled to have Robbie Boparat. Uh, then we have Council, San Diego City Council President Todd Gloria, who uh, represents District 3 and has been the Council President since 2013, a leader on issues such as the minimum wage. Uh, he authored Proposition C, which updated the city's veterans hiring policy, uh, and he served as interim mayor of San Diego when we had our much noted uh, mayoral crisis and, and served with distinction. We're also thrilled to have Chad Peace. Uh, he's uh, legal counsel and, and does uh, the manages the part of the communication strategy of the Independent Voter Project, which is a project with, a, I believe, a headquarters in San Diego, but it works across many states uh, to, to help ensure a, a meaningful voice in politics for people who don't align with the Democratic or Republican Party. So it's a group that works both with state legislators and helps to increase the mobilization of voters from the broad uh, cross-section of, of American politics. We're also thrilled to have Senator Marty Block. He represents my area, uh, Solana Beach, as well as Del Mar, Coronado, and San Diego. Uh, he has a great history of being a champion for educational opportunities. Uh, he introduced SB 850, uh, which increased the number, which is designed to increase the number of Californians with four-year degrees by a significant extent in 2025. So as a university campus, we are thrilled to have him here. Um, Sorry, I got I got one person out of order, so this is Senator Senator Block here. Uh, we also have Steve Dinkin, who is the president of the National Conflict Resolution Center, San Diego-based group that works with UC San Diego, among other groups, to uh, to help staff, students learn leadership skills in resolving conflicts. And before that, he was an employment and workplace mediator with the EEOC. So I think he has seen his share of, of civility and incivility, probably in many of those complicated cases. Um, so there's Senator Block. Uh, Richard Barrera is the Secretary Treasurer of the San Diego and Imperial Counties Labor Council. And he spent more than 20 years as a community and labor organizer, helping families build power and win economic, political, and social justice. So he's been a champion for affordable housing. He's been a big coalition builder, a champion for education, and, and is certainly a very important player in San Diego politics. 
Assembly member Marie Waldron represents the 75th district, goes from Escondido, San Marcos, and much of North County, San Diego. She's also uh, a local business owner who uh, helps uh, in, advocate in Sacramento for, uh, for legislation that, that respects and, and nourishes business and strong safety, uh, public safety. Uh, and finally, on the far left, is, uh, <laughs> is Assembly member Lorena Gonzalez who has been in the assembly since 2013, representing the, the 80th district, uh, Chula Vista National City, uh, and, and many neighborhoods within the city of San Diego. She's been a champion, has won many important victories, including the, the Paid Leave Act this year that, that was recently signed by the governor, and, and legislation that, uh, that allows Dreamer Law students to pass the bar and become attorneys in California. So, so we've got a lot of different viewpoints. Uh, the panel is going to, everyone's going to start off by making a brief statement. I'm going to ask them some questions, uh, and then we're going to turn it over to, to audience participation. We, we welcome all, all questions. Uh, we're going to have uh, chances for you to ask the question. I will repeat it for the purposes of, of our televised uh, audience, uh, and then we will hopefully get into as much interchange as possible on the question of civility. So, so why don't we start out with these sort of opening remarks, and uh, Robbie, are you okay with starting us out? All right, thank you so much. All right, hello everyone, thank you for coming. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity for me, and I'm really happy to you know, be here, so thanks for the opportunity to the poli -Sci department and UCSD. Um, I just wanna start off with a couple uh, broad remarks concerning the topic of civility. Um, Something that has come to my attention, I've actually never really been so involved in politics in my life as I have been since I've become the AS president of this university. Um, I'm a human biology major, a psych double major, I'm planning on going to medical school, so it's something that was very, very um, out, just kind of out there. And it's something that, you know, when I ran for AS president, I realized that you can't be just, you know, the AS president without being involved in politics. So I learned a lot. And I think one of the things that's come to my attention is, that there, civility in politics is something that I think is really um, over, I guess, exaggerated by the media. And I think one one thing, way to tribute that, I guess, is that you know we're a diverse group of people sitting on this council here. Um, I'm sitting with various politicians myself, uh, being a politician, I guess you could say, and. That being said, I mean, I have seen pa panels like this in the past. I think they went really well. I think this one's gonna go really well. And I guess, you know, I'll be proven wrong if someone gets in a fight up here today. <laughs> but that being said, um, I think that the media does exaggerate. And one of the things that, that does for society is it just shows the youth in particular that um, there are issues that, you know, are our federal government is dealing with, our state government, or our local government, and it, it is somewhat discouraging. Um, when the media portrays uh, individuals in the government um, you know, constantly disagreeing, I think it sends a message that there's not much change that any individual can do. Um, and you know, that in, inhibits people from voting, potentially. It you know, kind of sets a lot of people back, and that now they're not engaged, and they don't think that they can make a difference. And I think that's the some of the consequences, and you know we'll go into a lot more detail over this panel. Thanks so much, Council President Gloria. Thank you, Citizen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Todd's cool. Uh, Todd's always fine. Uh, I, I just appreciate people being here. I think this is a fascinating subject, uh, one that I'm interested in engaging on, uh, largely because I've been able to see the good and the bad on this issue, and I think you all know what I'm talking about. Um, and uh, I, I tend to agree, actually. I think that our differences are largely overblown. I think that conflict is what is interesting to people um, often, and I was actually just at a panel where there was some discussion um, of differences amongst the city council members. Uh, and it was interesting because we spent so much time on those areas where we have very close votes or perhaps partisan votes um, without any recognition of the fact that that's probably less than 5% of the votes that we take. Uh, the vast majority, and I'm sure this is probably true in the state legislature, is that we, you know, it's potholes and stop signs, guys. You know, it, there's, not a, there's not always conflict a, a, on that. And um, to, to your point, I think that when those rare occasions when that occurs, it's usually done in a very civil way. Um, I'm concerned that that isn't what is necessarily always seen 
in the public. And as a result, and that's why I'm glad that you're on the path that you're on, um, it does uh, turn off good people from participating, from doing civic engagement, uh, from really weighing in and being fully participatory. You know, our democracy only works when more and more people are involved. And I think that uh, our presence here today on a college campus is really telling. When I, when I speak to a lot of young people, uh, it's very interesting to me that by and large, they don't have a great deal of respect or interest in politics. They think it's a dirty business. Um, but that's largely because of the partisan nature and what they see as conflict, two things that they don't really want anything to be a, a part of. And yet they're deeply involved in their communities. They have a long experience with uh, community service and engagement. Um, and I see that as being political in a lot of ways. And I think that usually the, the, the example that I give is that every young person I talk to has done a beach cleanup or a canyon cleanup, served a meal at St. Vincent de Paul. And you know, if they've done that, then I ask them, well, don't you want to actually solve the root cause of environmental degradation or of homelessness or whatnot? And so you want to be involved in politics. And I think forums like this that can help highlight that uh, I think that those who do comport themselves in a civil way tend to do very well in this line of work. Yeah, we have strong feelings and, 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 and very passionate positions. Um, but I think about uh, Assembly Member Gonzalez, who I think, as you sort of alluded to in your introduction, is an incredibly passionate. She's well known for her passion, but is also an incredibly effective legislator that gets real results. And so um, it, your passion does not mean conflict. Uh, being in politics does not mean that you're uncivil. Uh, in fact, it's quite the opposite. And so I appreciate the opportunity to talk about that. Great. Chad. I don't think there could have been a better lead into my short introduction. First, I'm honored to be on this panel, very dis distinguished uh, co-panelist here. Um, I'm here representing the Independent Voter Project. <clears throat> one of the things that I emphasize that the Independent Voter Project, one, is not anti-party, and two, isn't about necessarily independent voters. It's about all of us. And if it goes to why are we so partisan, why are we so divisive, and how do we create a political process where people, especially young people who don't want to any more divisiveness in their lives than they already have um, can feel comfortable being involved, helping, and not having to join one of the divisive sides. So what we do at the Independent Voter Project, um, along with authoring California's top two nonpartisan primary, um, is we're conducting a lawsuit challenging the partisan nature of, of New Jersey's primaries. And we also run a news operation that is guided by not an ideology, but an etiquette. And so, at its core, all the things we do try to say, hey, politics shouldn't be a partisan-based process. It's good to have Democrats, it's good to have Republicans and everybody else involved, but at the end of the day, our solutions should be defined by how good they are. And so um, everything we do tries to go to, why does that partisan nature start in the first place and what can we do at the foundation, the electoral process, to try to solve it? Great. Thank you. Steve? Yes, I also am very uh, impressed with the panel and also the good work of UCSD as the president of the National Conflict Resolution Center. We've had an opportunity over many years to work on the campus and to work with leaders like Robbie to help instill different types of communication skills and conflict management skills to help uh, further the dialogue. Uh, we have a saying at our organization, it's conflict is inevitable, but it is manageable. And we work at all levels of society from the family to the community, uh, city, statewide, national, and international. And there's not a day that goes by that people don't come up to me and say like, Steve, you deal with conflict all the time. Why aren't you in Washington? You, you need to be in Washington, DC. And as I think about it and look at the incivility that we all seem to sense in our lives with, within our families and in our communities, is the Congress in Washington or politics, is it a, a manifestation of the development of our society over time? Or is it that people are seeing increasingly on TV, in social media, the behavior of politicians and that uh, as citizens we're now mimicking that behavior? So it's an interesting question of determining what really is the cause and effect and I hope that we can explore that a bit today. Great, thank you. Marty. Thank you. You know, as cynical as people can get when they watch the commercials between uh, DeMaio and Peters and, and other, other things we're being bombarded with every day, and by the way, it's even more cynical than that. Because I'm in the Senate, uh, like uh, Loretta and Marie, we, we live in two places, and it's incredible, but in, in Sacramento, exactly the same commercials are running, but at the very closing shot, instead of being 
DeMaio and Peters, it's Amy Barra, I guess, and Doug Osi. Yeah. I mean, so these are independent groups that are hammering Democrats all around the country and other independent groups hammering Republicans all around the country, saying terrible things with total disregard for who actually did what. And that's proven by the fact they're using the same commercials against candidates all around the country in contested races. So understanding the cynicism and also understanding the nature of politics, and, and since this is an academic institution, we should maybe start with a definition of terms. Politics, of course, comes from the Greek, poly, meaning many, and ticks, meaning small, nasty insects. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> th that aside, um, what, what to me is most telling when we have um, these commercials is they are almost always done, the really bad ones, by independent groups. Because it is to the advantage of those who seek elective office to be seen as civil and to let other folks do the dirty work for them. So it's sometimes a tough, a tough um, task for the voters to distinguish between who truly will be a civil legislator um, and who will be able to work well for their constituents and who, who is a person who not only shouldn't be in office, but should probably be in jail. Okay, thank you. Richard. Thank you. Uh, so maybe just to kind of challenge the discussion a little bit, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to maybe broaden out the uh, conversation to talk about not just simply civility in our public or political discourse, but is there actually civility in our society? So the, um, the two major issues that, you know, that I uh, spend my time uh, working on are, number one, do people who work for a living, who work hard, are they able to actually support their families? And we know that the answer, even in our own community here in San Diego, is that about a four in 10 of our families uh, do not uh, earn enough to simply pay their bills month to month to make ends meet. Um, I would argue that that's inherently uncivil. Uh, poverty is uncivil. And then the other issue that I work on uh, is, is education and the public education system. Um, the public education system is supposed to be the great equalizer in our democracy. It has been, I think, for probably everybody here on this panel, maybe everybody here in this room. And yet, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had the latest data that shows that California once the, um, you know, California once created the finest public education system anywhere in the world, uh, and now we're number 50 in the nation in per pupil spending. And we spend roughly on average 10 times more to incarcerate a young person than to educate a young person. Uh, so that's, to me, not reflective of a civil society. So I think we have to challenge ourselves when we ask, um, are we in fact, uh, are, are we living as a civil society? Uh, do people in the society actually have the opportunity uh, to engage and, and make progress? I actually believe that the nature of our political discourse uh, enables the incivility in our society. I believe if we had a public discourse that was at its core respectful, where people listened to each other and people um, uh, encouraged uh, participation, I don't think we would see four out of 10 people living in, essentially in poverty or that we would not be investing in our young people through the education system. So I, I believe in my core that public discourse, the more that um, we can engage each other in respectful ways, the more that our political decisions will reflect the core values of our society, which I think are not uh, what we're seeing in, in, uh, in some of these statistics. So I believe deeply in a public discourse that's about civility um, because I think it leads to more civil outcomes in our society, but I think the fact where we see uh, a lot of incivility, a lack of respect in our public discourse, I don't think that's something that happens coincidentally. I think that's something that's largely manufactured. And I think it's manufactured by um, folks who do not uh, 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 share the core values of, I think, the majority of people in, in, in our society. Thank you. Marie? 
Well, uh, I'm Marie Waldron, assembly member from North uh, San Diego area. Lorena and I are freshman assembly members. So my perspective comes from spending two years in Sacramento where when we got in there, all I was worried about was all this news about mudslinging and you know, arguing and just name calling on the assembly floor. And what I found was it actually wasn't like that at all. And um, as was mentioned, most of the votes, if not 97 to 98% of them are unanimous or bipartisan. And uh, you know, we really found a level of civility and I think um, the fact that we had a large class of freshmen, we had a lot of people who were willing to learn, who had come from various backgrounds. Um, many had been in local governments before or were part of a business family or had been in public service in some other way, healthcare or various. And I thought that was great. It brought us all together. Um, when I first got into politics, I served on the city council for 14 years locally. And uh, everyone said, gosh, you're gonna have to have a thick skin. And you know that's what you hear when you step out. Anyone who's gonna step out and stand for something, automatically they have to gird themselves because they'll be attacked from some, somebody who doesn't agree. And you know that's kind of something I think that's been going on. When it crosses the line is when it gets personal instead of dealing with the issue. One of the things I really learned and strive to do while I served the 14 years in local government, which was bipartisan and nonpartisan, I should say, um, was really to try to respect all opinions. You don't necessarily have to agree with them by respecting it, but not get personal about it, because I felt it was very important to be able to either vote against or vote for an issue, and then the next issue that came up vote with that person and you know, be able to have a civil conversation. Um, the surprising thing that I found was if I had voted a certain way, sometimes people in the community would walk right by and not say hello or ignore me. And I thought, how odd that is. You know, if they only knew, and I think we could all speak to it, how much thought goes into trying to make the right decision. You know, it's not something to me that's black and white. We really look at all sides and the, the trouble some of those decisions, you know, brought f for weeks prior to an actual vote of, you know, looking at both sides. And, you know, t t in someone's opinion, it was the wrong thing. So they're just, you know, now you're the enemy. And then I would find a year later, I would vote a certain way and then they're my best friend. And I always thought that that was kind of a unique thing. Um, but serving in government, you definitely do need to have some, some thickness of skin, I think, because if you're gonna stand for something, you, know, you need to be able to at least defend that position, but do it in a civil manner. Um, one of the thoughts that came to mind, I was so excited to serve in this panel, I actually RSVP'd the first day I got the invitation <laughs> because I thought it was so important, especially you know, when you're talking to young people or dealing with the college campus especially, I thought was important. Um, what came to mind was we had a very important issue in my city council uh, term and one of the council members said, you know, we can't come to agreement on this. The community was split, the council was split. He said, we just need to go into a room, let the insults fly for the first hour, and then work on the issue. And I always remember that because I thought it was kind of funny yet true. So I'm happy to be here. Good. Thank you, Lorena. Uh, well, being on the far left here, I think that's a funny uh, characterization. I, I think it's an assumption that, that folks make, um, which is interesting. I'll just point out that, uh, no, I won't point that out now. Um, we'll just go, I, I, I just saw some, some report cards that would suggest Marty maybe should be right here. Um, <laughs> I'm just teasing. So I, I think that Marie kind of brought up a lot of um, the basics of what I think about when I think of civility. And I think sometimes the, the pure definition of the word is what kind of um, catches us, right? Because we can't, uh, we, we can't replace 
the notion of civility and say, well, then we can't be passionate or advocates. I, I actually had Richard's job before and advocated for labor and for working folks um, throughout this community, which is in many ways, by definition, an adversarial role, um, especially in a city like San Diego that for so long has kind of, in a uncivil way, ignored um, the needs and desires uh, of low-income working poor. And so, you know, I came from an advocacy role, and sometimes people automatically think it's uncivil because we do protests, right? We do um, civil disobedience. And so somehow that's looked at in this role of, well, you must be just an agitator. And I think when I got to Sacramento, what a lot of people were shocked about, because I came straight from that aspect, the fact that what I would hear more and more is, I can't believe how nice you are. And I kind of laugh because I'm, I'm not always nice. Um, <laughs> but for the most part, if I don't have a reason to be mean, I mean, what, you know, of course I'm going to be nice. And I think Marie and I are perfect examples. We, we are on the same floor in the assembly. And as soon as I got there, um, her office reached out to mine right away and they'd send over donuts or coffee. And um, we have the same age child's sons, actually, who come up and visit in Sacramento. And she'd give me a list of all the cool places um, you could take a, a, about a 12-year-old in Sacramento. And, you know, on a personal basis, we get along very well. Obviously, we have a lot in common. Um, and, but sometimes we're not going to agree on policy issues. And being able to separate out those things are very important. I uh, have been reading lately and I've been very excited about these kids. I believe it's in Colorado where the school board had decided that they were going to take out the notion of civil disobedience out of the AP courses. It was shocking to me as somebody who, who believes strongly in, in the power and the need for civil disobedience, for discourse, for policy issues. And it was, it was uh, beautiful to see these kids react in a way that I thought was very appropriate, and that's with civil disobedience. Um, and for me, that's very important because I represent South San Diego. I represent um, working class folks who disproportionately are poor, disproportionately are headed by single women households, um, disproportionately compared to the rest of the state, um, may not be here legally or may not be fully documented, um, and need an advocate in Sacramento. So I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't, with passion, represent their needs and desires. But that doesn't have to be personal and doesn't mean if somebody disagrees um, with my position that when the debate is over, we can't go have a drink. And I think that that's where we really need to, um, to separate out is the policy discussion versus a personal relationship. I have personal relationships with a lot of people that I don't agree with about everything. And I, don't, I, I think that's okay. I actually think I learn from that. And I think that, that we've got to get to a society where it's okay if we disagree when it gets personal, though is when it's inappropriate. And I think, unfortunately, with the rise of talk radio, what I have found, at least being on the left and having a few, just a few controversial bills, um, there are certain areas where, unfortunately, you have talk radio that really just um, has capitalized on people's anger. And they capitalize on the personalization of that anger. And so sometimes when we get calls or letters or emails into my office, I'm even shocked by what people will say. And it's not that they disagree that we need stronger borders or that um, we shouldn't be providing services for people who aren't here legally or that they, you know, you can, you can define an argument in a certain way. And then you can say to me, you know, go back to Mexico. Well, that's nice, but I didn't come from Mexico. I was born in Oceanside, you know? And so when they say go back home, I, I think, wh why, why is it that we go to that very, um, the, 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 common denominator of just trying to somehow insult somebody. Um, I had a diaper bill last year that caused even comments that I don't even like to repeat some of them about what my people should be doing, and that wasn't having babies if they're on welfare. Um, and it was, it was shocking to me and so personal, and, um, and it really does become personal. At one point, I had to tell somebody on the phone, um, I'm not a welfare mom. I'm a single mom. That's true. Whatever you heard on the radio is true. I'm a single mom, but I'm not a welfare mom. I have three degrees. I'm a legislator, you know, this is, I'm advocating on behalf of somebody, but I think a lot of the media has taken issues and just served to personalize them so much, that's what becomes uncivil. Great. Well, thank you so much. So, so what we're hearing from the panelists is that the, the demise of civility may be greatly exaggerated, especially if you're talking about the Capitol, you know, City Hall and, and the AS Council, but that there are other realms where there is a lot of un incivility in campaigns and, and in the media. So, so so let's get into this question of when we want civility and when incivility might be okay. Because incivility, is, as you're saying, it can, it can allow people to intensely express their views, to insult each other until you can start making a deal and to, and to, to demonstrate true passion. So 
does anyone want to take a shot at delineating so you know when we need to have civility to come to collective decisions and when it's appropriate to have incivility and to, to let the insults and let the passions fly? Who wants to wade well, into that first? Rich? Yeah, I'll throw in. I, I actually think we always need civility. And I think when we don't have civility, again, I, I believe it's because there are, um, there are people who are strategically making a decision uh, to uh, not have respectful discourse because they believe that respectful discourse won't yield the outcomes that they want. I think that's, I think that's the root of incivility in our public discourse. It's manufactured. It's strategic. Mm -hmm. and, and so when we talk about people expressing their interests, what is a more uh, um, civil uh, expression of interest than, for instance, the civil rights movement, uh, the farm workers movement? These were incredibly respectful um, uh, uh, messages going out to the broader public that were carrying a strong voice and that were expressing, you know, a strong opinion. So, I, again, I think it's very it's important that we distinguish between people being passionate, people standing for something, people uh, challenging you know, the, the status quo in society um, from incivility. There's nothing uncivil about uh, standing up and, and calling on our better nature as a society to, to, to do better. I think when we see the kind of stuff that Lorena is talking about, um, this sort of manufactured anger, dishonesty, disrespect, um, that would be my definition of incivility, and again, I think it's being done for a reason. Mm -hmm. Good. Anyone else want to pick up on that? Yeah. I'd like to put a perspective from you know our independent voter project perspective that really isn't talked about is why do we have the incivility? As we said, the folks up on this panel and most of the people in office really are civil people, and they'll listen to anybody, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. I don't think Lorraine is a popular representative because she's a Democrat. It's because she's Assemblywoman Gonzalez is a good representative, right? So, so why do we have the incivility? And I think what we look at is that you know, the political consultants are as, as big a culprits as this, is that there's an advantage to incivility when you've made a process about being a competition between a left and a right. If we've predefined all of the issues as being left or right, that creates a competition between two teams. So we've artificially created a discussion where there's one answer on the left and one answer on the right, and you're either on our team and you're gonna win or you're their team, you're gonna win. Elections shouldn't be about winning a, a particular argument. It should be who can discuss that argument the best and who can listen to everybody the best. So at its core, what creates the incivility is having a left and a right competition and the incivility that occurs deliberately, and it is deliberate, to get the folks who want to think for themselves out of that competition, out of that game. And you can't disconnect the idea of civility and incivility with the declining voter turnout. As we become more divisive, more people don't want to participate, we become more uncivil, and really that hurts all of us, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, but especially all the good folks who are leaders right now in the country who have to answer the phone calls to people who are susceptible to this incivility and get riled up by it. Good. All right. Any, anyone else? Yeah, Marie. Um, well, I agree with with what you're saying, and one of the things that I see is that there's a failure to listen. I mean, so many people are just willing to speak, and they're worried about what they're going to say next, and not listening to what the other person is saying. Um, one of the things that I actually really worked on was trying to be thoughtful about legislation, trying to you know, understand why, so that I actually would step out and go against even what my caucus recommendations were on many, many bills, so that I could see, you know, when you get into it and you listen and you read it, it's not just black and white. And if you're thoughtful about it, um, and then if someone would say, well, gee, why did you do that? You're the only Republican who's ever voted for that depending on what it was, through the years these bills would come up. And when I would explain it, they would understand it. There's, there's just a lot of information, and the media is part of the issue too, because they can only get so much out, and people are very busy. So it's soundbite, soundbite, soundbite. You don't get all the information, and it's not black and white. And I think you know, the fact that so many of us have stood up in leadership roles, it's our duty 
to be thoughtful and to listen. And, you know, we can be role models of the civility that we're discussing. I mean, when we leave here today, we're going to get on the freeway in <laughs> packed traffic. How long is it going to take before somebody, you know, cuts somebody off and then there's the hand gesture right off the bat without even a thought? I'm always amazed that people, that that's their first reaction. I, it's not, you know, anything I've ever done. And, you know, that reaction, and I think, well, gee, you know, what if... I was a policeman, they wouldn't do it, because they know. They know to respect authority, and you know, in, in cases, there's a lack of respect. Mm -hmm. And I think that's all part of that, not listening. Great. Marty, you wanted to help it? Yeah, just, I think it's really important to distinguish between campaigns and governing, because what, what most of what Maria's talked about is governing. And I think the incivility, at least in Sacramento, and I think in City Hall too, is really overblown. I, I think uh, we tend to be, very civil places with, for the most part, bright, caring people, with a couple exceptions on either side, perhaps. Um, campaigns, totally different. I mean, campaigns are set up to be incivil. I mean, when you have a football game, you don't expect the Chargers and the, the Broncos to go out and be nice to one another. They're fighting. They're trying to win. And campaigns, you're fighting and trying to win. So you tend to do what works. And the reason the consultants use negative cam campaigns, negative advertising, is because it works. And I disagree a bit with Chad. I don't think it's a matter of Democrats versus Republicans or right versus left. When you get Dem on Dem races now with uh, two, you know, two candidates from the same party running, they're just as hostile, violent, and negative as Dem Republican races. Same for Republican Republican races. Um, it's just the system. How do you play the game in a civil way and still win? And when when we discover how to do that, we'll, we'll see more civility. I, I don't think campaigns are going to get civil in, in the near future. They haven't been civil for the 200 years of this country and, and certainly haven't been civil for thousands of years of civilization. Governing is a different story. We need to keep governing as a, a civil activity. Great. So, so we've got incivility in, in, in our campaigns, talk radio, freeways, AFC West. Um, what do we do about it? What are the solutions, either... Are there solutions either institutional, changing the rules of the game that will, that will lead to, to, to less conflictual politics, or solutions through co the conflict resolution world that, that, that work and, and, and ones that, that we could follow as best practices? What gets us, what gets us towards more civility in these realms? Yeah. Well, I, I think with regard to solutions, there, there are some structural issues with regard to whether there's open primaries or not within the governance system, but there's also um, techniques and manners of communication, uh, what we call the art of communication, and how individuals are respectfully listening uh, or communicating their point of view. And uh, there's a lot of different types of exercises that we focus on. And there's an exercise around a controversial topic that we teach, uh, whereby people might have a different point of view, uh, but the key is that you teach individuals how to acknowledge uh, what the other person is saying, and that acknowledgement doesn't mean necessarily agreement. So people can have a different perspective on a topic. They can listen by acknowledging and still feel comfortable that they can hold uh, their own position. And I, I think if, if, if folks within society and within government do feel that they're being heard, I think that'll lessen the volume uh, that we're hearing on talk radio or in the community or in politics. Mm -hmm. I, I also, I just want to add um, to that a little bit, and I think one of the challenges, at least for me, um, is cultural, right? So I've had to tell people a lot of times, I talk loud. In my family, when we have a discussion, we can all be agreeing, and you probably walk in and think we're arguing, right? I come from a Latino culture that, I don't know, the loudest person's heard, you know, the person who eats the first gets the most. No. Um, the, we, but we just have, we're very passionate people. I mean, not everybody, I'm generalizing, but it's a cultural thing. I also uh, came from a long line of women who believed that passive aggressiveness is probably the height of incivility, quite frankly. If you don't like it, then tell me. If I don't like it, I'm going to tell you now. That doesn't mean I don't like you. 
It just means I don't like it. And so I think as we become a more diverse society, we have to realize that, um, and we've dealt with this a lot, actually, I won't go into detail in the Democratic Caucus on the Assembly side, um, between Latinos and Asians. You know, at, at some point we had to say, we have Latino women who said, you guys, we, this is just how we talk. This is not personal. I'm not yelling at you. I might be yelling, and I'm still not yelling at you. Um, and, and it's something you see in marriages and, and friendships and everything. But there, there are cultural differences that cause us to act in a certain way. And the same thing that bothers people, that I'm very direct, that I'll tell you, I don't like that idea at all. And this is why. Well, I, I guess I could say, I understand that's an important idea to you. I mean, this would be very unnatural to me. <laughs> it's not one which I agree with. But at the same time, I've been told from young people in particular, that's one of the things they like the best about me and are more apt to vote because I'll just be very honest and a little blunt, but it's not meant to be offensive. So I think all of us have to, and I have to um, do my best to deal with people who um, don't come from a background that that's they're that upfront or they're the, that direct and that you have to really listen to figure out what they're trying to tell you rather because they're not going to tell you straightforward. So I think a lot of our society, as we become more diverse, as women are entering these arenas in a different way, um, that we have to be aware that people communicate differently. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Great. Thank you so much. So, so let's take this back to, to San Diego and to UC San Diego. So we're going to have some contentious issues in both those places this year. So I don't, I don't know if divestment from Israel is back on the agenda, but this has been one that is that is roiled the campus. Uh, minimum wage. I don't know what happened at noon today, but we may be having a, a big citywide debate on minimum wage. So what what do you hope for, and and, and what are you planning to do as as as, as the two of you, Todd and, and and Robbie, look forward to those debates? How do you think it should happen, and 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 what are you going to try to do to to keep things moving in a civil manner? Okay, um, I'll start. Uh, one, hopefully we don't get too, too many contentious issues this year, but if we do, um, you know, it's something that has definitely, and we've seen contentious issues on AS before. Um, I think one of the things that I've learned are the biggest skill set that I've gained from being involved in student government on this campus is actually how to converse and how to discuss issues with people who come from different backgrounds. Um, that being said, I've taken that away despite the amount of contentious issues I've seen, the amount of people walking out of meetings. And... I think it really shows that there isn't a you know an opportunity for people to really learn from being involved in a governing body. Um, that being said, if it, if an issue does come up, uh, I really just hope to see that students are engaged in the issue. I think that being a student government or being any form of governing body, we we I mean I do, and I hope that all of us here do want to see. Um, civic engagement from the individuals that the issues actually affect, and when we are alienating a specific group of people. For, in my case, it would be students with a piece of legislation, and those voices of those people are not being taken into account, or um, when they do try to express their voices, they are you know, alienated or threatened, um, which doesn't happen very often, but I know it happens you know, to, to all the different types of governing bodies. Um, that being said, that just creates a, uh, you know, a place where no one is satisfied at the end of the day. Everyone leaves that meeting thinking, like, this could have gone a lot better. Um, different ways that, you know, AS has thought about addressing it is just, you know, kind of getting rid of a lot of the party politics is something that we've looked at. And um, I think that addresses a little bit more campaigns. Um, I think a lot of times government leaders or politicians will promise something and they, when they get to office, they understand the intricacies of why maybe this is not the most feasible course of action anymore. Inter, you know, having discussions with people from different areas, but then, of course, a lot of their constituency is pushing them to, you know, to do what they promised to do. And when it comes down to it, you can explain that, you know, I've looked into it. Maybe it's not the best course of action anymore. How can we change it? There's people out there who will say, no, you promised this, and we need to go full force with it. And that's something that's affected a lot of students on this campus, and I think student governments everywhere. And so kind of working with those groups to make sure that they're involved in the reconstruction of new pieces of legislature. So, you know, reaching out to people who care about the issue and making them a part of the government, I think, is the most efficient way. Todd? Um, well, let me give you a little piece of information. We will be having a discussion about minimum wage, um, and it'd be my expectation that will last through June of 2016. Um, but we'll find that out for cer certain uh, next week uh, when the city council votes. Um, it's a tough question to answer. Um, and I, I would simply ask for, um, uh, 
for a, a, a discussion that is on the facts. And I would, not to be uncivil, um, but to acknowledge the reality for what it is, um, you had some very wealthy folks go out and misinform the public and utilize their extreme wealth to keep people in poverty. And in the midst of the arguments that they made, um, there's no recognition of the fact that, that there are people who are struggling. As Richard is mentioning, if, if four in 10 San Diegans aren't earning enough to live here, we've got a problem. And no one suggests that minimum wage is a panacea, um, but those opponents aren't really providing any other alternatives. Um, and so absent that, um, it seems to me you're endorsing um, a level of poverty in the community that I find to be unacceptable. And so if we can at least base with facts so that you don't create a front organization called the Small Business Coalition that we all know uh, is well-funded by large corporations, but we won't know that for a fact until sometime about December, but we'll set that aside. Maybe we need some legislation around that, guys. Um, <laughs> And by the way, we also weren't allowed to look at the signatures as they're being validated. Only the proponents could, but, but folks on my side weren't allowed in the room. We should probably fix that as well. Um, but sorry, I'm, I'm going to get off my soapbox the now. The transparency panel was, was earlier this <laughs> oh, week. Oh, is it okay? Yeah. I'll, I'll mail them my comments. Um, the, the issues, I, I would love to have a discussion of the issue on its factual basis and to say, you know, we can agree that this is this is true. I mean, the numbers are there. They're not my numbers. They're, uh, you know, independent uh, numbers. And then, you know, what is your solution? I don't think we'll hear a lot of uh, anything other than uh, from the other side that this is not the right thing to do. Um, that's troubling. And I think most importantly, um, if, if you do not support doing this, then you are, uh, because they say that, you know, that businesses can't accommodate this. And of course, there's plenty of history that shows that that's not accurate. But um, they say that they can't accommodate it, which is an, impl an implicit endorsement of allowing poor people to figure out how to make it work on their own. So they're, they're not willing to ask businesses to do what they're asking people living in poverty to do. Um, so it, it's going to be, uh, it's my hope that it would not be uncivil. If we can keep it to the facts, um, I think we'll win. I think even regardless, we're going to win because we know that 63% of San Diegans can see this is a problem and that this is a viable solution. Um, but, but it is troubling because it's been an interesting experience. How do you appreciate that you know, coming off of, as I'll use your own words, a, a successful uh, ex uh, experience in the mayor's office, the number of people have come up, you know, Todd, you're amazing, you've been great, da, da, da. but this minimum wage thing, <laughs> you, you know, and uh, to I think Marie and Lorena's point, the fact that I'm concerned about people living in poverty doesn't make me a bad person. Uh, and, uh, and I would challenge those individuals to, to, to kind of get off of that. And if they can't support me in this effort, then tell me what they can support me in, in terms of addressing this problem. Yeah, if I can address this briefly, um, I, I chair the Jewish caucus in the state legislature, assembly members and, and senators who are Jewish or who are allies of the Jewish community. And the divestment issue that you mentioned um, has been obviously a very hot topic. One thing that makes it so difficult is that we're not talking about this is civility, this isn't civility. I mean, it is a continuum, as anybody on the panel would be happy to support. Um, you know, the, the height of incivility on campus is hate crime. Okay, it's even all the way to murder, I and mean, that's incivility, or sexual assault, hate crime in a, in a different way. Um, certainly disagreement on a college campus is part of the reason college campuses are here, academic disagreement. Somewhere between those two, you get to incivility, and I think we may not have complete agreement on where that point is reached. Um, the, the, the problem that we in the Jewish caucus have been having with some of the issues going on on campuses is that we're hearing repeated stories of students being harassed in classes, not just by classmates, but professors, because they happen to support Israel. My guess is there are Muslim students um, who are getting the same treatment from other professors. So it's, I don't want to be one-sided on this at all, but it's the, the better we can delineate that line between fair debate and discussion that's important on a college campus and hate crimes over here, in between what, what's fair game and what's not. And that's, I wish I had some good answer for you, I don't. But that's really the problem, is that uh, um, what, it's in the eye of the beholder sometimes. For example, um, when, I, I hate softball press questions, unless they're directed to me. Um, I mean, when I, when I watch a, an interview of somebody and, and the, the member of the press reporter asks a question, the person obviously avoids it. We all learn to do that. And then the, the reporter doesn't follow up or doesn't press it. That bothers me, no end. Um, I think in this, in this country, following up by reporters is considered by some to be incivil. 
Um, I mean, the, the least civil press conferences I remember seeing when I was younger were around Watergate. And thank God they were not civil. Now, some of the reporters might say that was civil. It was just a disagreement. Uh, if you ask the White House, that was incivility at the height uh, to the president. Um, if, if you watch British news, you know, some of our cable channels, you have Sky News and things. British reporters are far less civil, far less careful not to ask questions that might upset an interviewer. I think one reason they do it in this country is because you want the person to come back on your show, and they won't if you ask a follow-up question. So a dose of incivility can be a good thing. It's just where the line is drawn. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah, address yeah. one. Is there an opportunity to address you on two points? One back to the, the divisiveness in the elections. I always find it ironic that so many candidates who run for office with good intentions because they want to change the world hand over their campaigns to political consultants and to tell them things like, you have to run a negative campaign because that's all that works. Well, you have a, a consultant culture where they've taken it as an axiom that running negative campaigns works. So, okay, so you have two candidates, they both run a negative campaign, two, one wins. Negative campaign worked, right? What it's worked to do is push out all kinds of people who want to have an honest discourse during the campaign. And so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't accept your premise that you run negative campaigns, one, and I wouldn't accept, two, that you had to hand it over and let your consultant run a negative campaign. I think you can run positive campaigns and win if we just realize that more society is waiting for a, pol for a positive campaign than we, than we give them. Um, the second is... I think when it goes to civility, you're absolutely right on this, is that civility doesn't mean disagreement. I'm having one right now. I think I'm having a civil conversation. But it goes whether it's, you know, whether it's Israel or whether it's the minimum wage. I mean, defining people as for Israel or against it or for the minimum wage or against it sets up a conditions for discourse where you're on my side or the other. That's my point. There's a lot of in and between. I can say, well, maybe we ought to raise the minimum wage if we also reduce the billions of dollars we're spending over, overseas, right? Maybe we can help Israel here if we spend some money differently over here. The, the, the problems we face today are, are very, very complex. And we've reduced everything into you're for this little issue or you're against it. We have a much bigger picture and I think we ought to start talking about the big picture. So, so I'll put in a quick plug for some UCSD research on this question of does negative campaigning work and what does it have to do with the rules of the game? So, so across Latin America, you have some two-party systems and you have some multi-party systems and they generally have to do with what the election rules are. Scott Desposado is a professor here, worked with a lot of uh, undergraduates uh, to, who, who spoke uh, Portuguese and Spanish to, to record lots of TV commercials aired in those campaigns all across those countries. Watch them, code them as negative and positive. And what you found out is in those two-party races, lots of negative campaigns because it's, you know, if somebody doesn't like you for being negative, they don't have anywhere else to go. But then when you have three parties or more, then there's that one other place for them to go. You see more positive campaigns. So, so we've seen a few possible solutions here, focusing campaigns on the facts, uh, avoiding ad hominem attacks, acknowledging uh, the, the viewpoints of those you're opposing, getting out of the, the, cons the, the left-right consultant culture, and, and allowing people to, to compromise and, and giving them the space to do that in the policymaking process. So now now I want to throw things open to the audience. So we have about a half an hour left. I may reserve the right to, to come back to my script, but I want to make sure we have, uh, we have a chance to, to answer your questions and, and move the conversation in whichever direction you want. So raise your hands. You can answer, ask a question. I'll repeat it here for the purpose of the TV, and then people will pop in. So uh, Joe. Oh, we have a mic here, so I will not have to repeat your question. No, it's, I think it's on now. Uh, we have a Fair Political Practices uh, Commission that finds candidates for unethical campaigning or violations. Do you find that to be an effective, an effective tool in, in this uh, dialogue? Okay, I have yet to be fined by the FPC. <laughs> um, but this is one of the problems, and in, in it's one of the problems I was thinking about it when... Um, Marie was talking about driving home. I'm a bad driver. I just am. So sometimes I cut people off and I'm like, I'm sorry. And they're still like, they're still mad. And you just want to be like, no, I'm, I'm really, I'm just a bad driver. Just give me some slack, you know? I'm trying here. Um, it's the truth. People make mistakes, right? And, and 
human error is something that we just have to acknowledge and accept. And the problem with our local ethics commission in particular, but the FPBC as well, is sometimes they, um, they go after people for, for with, with, where there was no intention. There was no real corruption, if you will. There was human error, either by a treasurer, um, by a candidate, by a consultant. Now, there are other problems. We've seen it in the Senate this year. Those problems were not tackled by the FPPC. They were tackled by the FBI. You know, And so we really, the problem with the FPPC, as I see it, is um, sometimes basic human error or problems where corrective action is necessary um, instead leads to the number one thing that will be reported in that negative campaign against you. And it, it, it really um, serves to, as, as you said, does it help with corruption? It's not, or, you know, does it help with the problem? Well. I guess it helps people be a little bit more attentive, but sometimes you can't help it or your treasure steals from you or whatever the problem is. Um, sometimes it's beyond your control. And, uh, and I think that, unfortunately, we've set up a system that allows for very, um, the Ethics Commission is the worst named thing ever in the city of San Diego because I don't know a single, I mean, maybe somebody's going to correct me, a single local elected who hasn't been deemed by the Ethics Commission. Well, pretty soon. Have you not been deemed at all? I was wondering. <laughs> but probably a committee in support of you has. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In fact, I'm pretty <laughs> sure a committee in support of your candidacy had been deemed by the Ethics uh, Commission um, <laughs> that I led. Uh, so, so it becomes this like you're unethical somehow, and, and, and it has nothing to do with ethics. It has to do with you know, did you use 11.5 font instead of 12 point font? Um, so, in some ways, these systems, although serve a purpose, perhaps we've given them too much of um, power, and we, we not even power, just we we accept, we allow other people to communicate too much about them that there's some fault or some motive behind it. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Um, Anyone else want to? I'd like to, just to add, I agree with what Lorena has said, and also the fact that a lot of times the FPPC, or at least a request to the FPPC, is used as a political tool, especially right at election time. They're going to file a complaint, even though it turns out to be unfounded. Um, one of the things that was kind of an eye-opener getting up to Sacramento was all of this gift reporting stuff. I mean, if you go to lunch with someone and they pay $10, that kind of triggers, oh, well, we can't, you know, buy you lunch because that's like buying a vote. And, you know, it, it's gotten to the point of really overburdensome in so many ways because we're trying to control, I guess, or have a feeling that you're controlling, you know, how people are, right, uh, corruption or uh, what could be conceived as corruption. And I agree that sometimes mistakes are made they're not meant or at any point meant to be you know money laundering or anything so thank goodness i have not been fined either but i do see how it's used as a political tool yeah and if i could just add a brief observation not related to your question see we're avoiding the question <laughs> um, but loretta gonna follow and up, marie though. both talked about driving and and the issues of the person you you cut them off accidentally and they flip you off um, that wouldn't happen if you were walking down the street and somebody cuts you off, because there you have some accountability. The anonymity, I think, really adds to incivility. And one reason we have to know who's paying for these ads, you know, who is the independent voter PAC really? Who's paying for these ads? Um, because that will tend to cut incivility if you know what's, what's really happening. The, the best example is in cyberbullying. I mean, you have, you have these people who would never say the things they say about you in their comments to Sacramento Bee or whatever if they had to see you face to face. And we're in more and more an anonymous society, mostly because of cyber issues, and uh, that's a problem. Good. Yeah, question that. Well, first, first of all, I'm a little surprised. Everybody up there has got a microphone. This is televised. Why aren't you all talking at the same time <laughs> over one another like <laughs> most? Uh, uncivil uh, news broadcasts. Um, so, so just a, a, a seed of a topic, and that is when, because there is passion, and, and in legislation there's going to be winners and losers. There, there's going to be, you know, a majority that, that compromise may not happen. Somebody's going to, uh, uh, the, the minimum wage may win or lose, you know. And so what's, what is, what allows people to have to remain civil but yet lose and not be viewed by the voters as you, you're spineless? 
Well, tough. Number one, it's going to win. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. All right. You know, it, it's a great, you know, actually, I, if I can take it to a different issue just for a moment, but similarly uh, uh, controversial, is the linkage fee, commercial linkage. This is the fee that developers pay uh, for commercial development that goes into our affordable housing trust fund. It hasn't been raised in 17 years. Um, it was finally, well, conceptually blessed about a week ago, will be formally blessed this next week. This is after years and years of it being a zero-sum game. What's really interesting is that when we finally had the political will in an audit report uh, to push people to the table, it's amazing what folks agreed to. And so we have a compromise that got a 7-1 vote of the city council. And I'll remind you, at least uh, for that vote, there were uh, five Democrats and three Republicans. So you saw it was bipartisan, point I made earlier. Uh, but secondarily, you had the affordable housing advocates and the development industry there saying, this is a good deal. Now, this was after three previous deals where people felt like they were losing, but we eventually got to a point where everyone felt like they could win. And you know, if you'd asked, and, and mind you, this was a subject of a referendary petition as well, so someone harassed you in front of the grocery store to get your signature on this too. Um, point is, what was eventually adopted um, was something that everyone felt good about. So I don't know that it's always about being winners and losers, but it's about whether or not folks can really, number one, as I was getting to with the minimum wage a moment ago, acknowledge the problem. In this particular case, it took the development industry to recognize, number Number one, we have a humongous affordable housing problem here. I think we can all agree on that. And then number two, they have some responsibility to address that problem. And that 17 years of doing nothing was getting us nowhere. And to their credit, they acknowledged all that. On the opposite side, the affordable housing community had to acknowledge that they couldn't get everything they wanted and they'd have to compromise somewhere. I share that for, for two reasons. One is I sort of push back perhaps on the fact that someone always has to lose. If people are willing to be honest, be factually based again, they know that this fee is not gonna kill their project. It's not gonna be a jobs tax and run people out of town. They eventually agree to a 100% increase in the fee forever. So, I mean, it gives you just a sense of what is numerically possible when everyone's willing to be honest with everyone. Uh, and lastly, and this may be indicative to the minimum wage question, is that the deal that was struck is substantially similar to the 2011 agree agreement that the development industry shot down. Um, so while we didn't win year one, uh, we eventually got there. Um, and so I'll stand by my comment that we'll win on the minimum wage. Great. Steve. I, I think that the discussion on, on winning or losing on incivility or our civility, sometimes it takes us off course on what really is some of the, the key issues that, that we're facing. And I, I think it's the impact of incivility that's a greater problem, which is oftentimes disengagement or avoidance. And I see that across all the different types of cases and situations that arise in, in the community or in the workplace when a conflict arises, let's say in a boardroom, uh, people tend to avoid it. And I think that's a more serious problem. And, and maybe we're not seeing that on the city council, but I, I get that sense at the national level, at the congressional level, that we don't have the same level of engagement between uh, congressmen and women uh, that we once did. And it's not really the focus on who's winning or losing. It's, it's whether or not you know, politicians and, and other people in the community are continuing to engage because that's what's really going to move the country forward. I want to actually very much agree with that. The, um, and it, it, here's an example. And um, uh, Christine and I were talking about this. Uh, Christine's a, a parent at, the, at San Diego High School. And we had an issue that came up uh, over the last couple of weeks at San Diego High School where there's a controversy about drug sniffing dogs. Um, should we have uh, dogs come onto campus and basically randomly, uh, you know, sniff out uh, the potential for students who are, who are carrying drugs? And it's, it's, uh, it's a topic that I think people were wanting to avoid, you know, for, specifically, you know, for the reason that you're talking about. I think the administration of the school felt that there was a, there was a huge problem with drugs on the, on the campus. And they feel that the sniffer dogs is one of a, you know is, is an effective strategy of dealing with the problem. But they felt that if you open this up to conversation with the community, that there will be an outcry of opposition, and they won't be able to use that strategy anymore. And so there's a reluctance, I think, to actually engage the school community um, 
in that conversation. So we had a conversation, uh, a small conversation, uh, you know, maybe about 20 or 30 parents uh, and a couple of students who, par who participated last week with the principal and the school police chief and others. And it was a fascinating conversation because we had sitting around a circle, people from the school community who wanted to really understand the issue, get the facts, you know, as Todd was talking about, and really start to engage in solutions. And ringing the circle of people participating in the discussion were folks from the media who were revved up because they thought this is going to be a juicy, this is going to turn into something very uncivil. And we're going to get to cover it, you know, live. And, uh, and, and I, you know, as the facilitator of the meeting, uh, a couple of times I had to actually cut off uh, TV reporters who were throwing, you know, grenades you know, from the back of the room because, not because the questions that they were asking were appropriate or inappropriate, but because people didn't want that. People actually wanted to have a discussion, wanted to engage, wanted to be participants in a democratic process rather than consumers of, you know, somebody's interpretation of a democratic process. And I think we're actually in that, you know, I, I think we're gonna get to, you know, a better solution, but I, yeah, I think the, um, the reluctance sometimes of people to actually engage um, is, is, is because you think, oh my God, once this gets opened up, it's gonna turn into a circus, and then I'm probably gonna lose, you know, and, 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 I, and I'm reluctant to engage in something that, um, you know, is, is, gonna, is gonna be uh, uh, oversimplified and then my position loses, where I think I very much agree, you know, with what several folks have said, uh, and, and I think I think Ravi's, you know, it kicked us off. I think engagement is really the the solution, you know, to, to this issue. Um, but I think if people can engage in processes that are honest, that are respectful, even in the end, if people have certain disagreements, I think we'll get most of the way towards solutions where a lot of people agree, and even people, you know, who might come out on the side where you don't get everything that you want believe that it's worth going through this process. But again, we've got folks, whether it's from the media or political consultants or you know, people who um, purposely want to blow that kind of real engagement process up. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, right in the second row. Um, I do not believe that civility trump over fact. So what I'm saying here might be construed as uncivil, but I have a question. This is how I see it, and I'm not political by all means. I think that our nation gone through something. The good is to give more health care to people. The bad is the justice system that let the banker fraudulent go free, and the people who did, did nothing got put in jail. The third one is what I classify as the ugly, right? The good, the bad, and the ugly. And I have never seen anything like this. The Congress, Congress that is using obstruct, obstruction Stop everything, stop, you know, even though we all go to fight, we fight, we decide, have the decisive result in something, then somehow along the line, we have to come back and go together. So my question is, do you see obstruction to be an uncivil act? I'm, I'm gonna, first of all, thank you for the question, because earlier I, I was thinking something else when we were talking about people disengaging. There is, um, I believe, a very real plan in this country to, to have people disengage. Um, because when you have such mass inequality, one of two things will happen. Um, people will give up and just continue and not engage in the political process, not utilize the right to vote, the right to be active, and, and then it's not a threat to the establishment. Or people will get together and rise up either in a democratic, with a small d way, or in a more revolutionary way to force change. That is very scary, and it's not a right or left thing. It is very scary to the status quo. The status quo, I mean, that, that to me has been the biggest frustration as a legislator. It's not that I might disagree ideologically with somebody. It's that people aren't willing, whether it's my side or the other side, quite frankly, to, to challenge what we accept as the way things should be, or, or, or what somebody else says this is the way you should act. So I, I think you're right. I think it is very incivil to, um, to, to go forward. I remember I was just asked um, in the editorial board of the Union Tribune um, why I wouldn't introduce legislation on, on um, voter ID. 
It's a perfect example, and I know we probably disagree with this here, but this is the way I, I explain that. We don't have a problem with fraudulent voting in this country. There is no study out there that will show you the people who shouldn't be voting or are flocking in masses to the polls and, and casting a vote or you know dead people in Chicago, whatever that is, whenever it happened. It, it, that doesn't happen. There's nothing out there to solve. Why would we create a law that solves a problem that doesn't exist when that law, all it will do is, is disenfranchise folks? We should be questioning why somebody would be pushing out a, 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 a product like that without the problem. Now, if somebody came to me and they said, I have a district and this has been shown and we, we, we have proof, this is what's going on, okay, then I'll listen. But, but don't create further laws to, to disengage more of our community, in particular the kind of community I represent, in order that we continue with the status quo. And so I think you're right, and I love the question, and I think that's where you can't get rid of the passion and the agitation, quite frankly, and, and the defensiveness um, for people who are disengaged, because that's part of it. Chet? Okay. Uh, follow up, I think that's a very good answer first. And second, I, I promise my answer is not unrelated to your question. And we go back to the creating the issue, right? We have a voting rights issue in this country. It's about voter ID. And you're for voter ID because you believe in accountability, you're against fraud, or you're against voter ID because you're a racist, right? And these, that I'm, not, I'm using that cynically, is that's how those, the, that debate has been engaged in the public, right? We filed a lawsuit in New Jersey, okay? We filed a lawsuit saying their closed primary system is unconstitutional. 47% of New Jersey voters unaffiliated with a political party. Their turnout in primary elections, 9%. You know how much the taxpayers spent on those elections? Taxpayer money spent $12 million. 95% of elections are decided in the primary. And New Jersey's district attorney just said that Unless you join one of the two parties, you have no constitutional right to participate in an election you funded. So when I'm talking about creating the superficial debate, I'm saying political consultants have created a superficial debate about voting rights. We have voting rights issues that are much bigger. We got to start talking about them. Okay, good. Others on that one? Okay. Uh, I had a question in the, close to the back row. Oh, oh right, you. Great. Thank okay. you. Um, this question is from Raul Carranza, who's right here. Um, he says, what role do you think independent outside groups play in legitimate campaigns? And would you agree that they have too much influence on policy? And you have to give up all the IEs in your district if you say it. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> so yeah, who wants to hop in on that one? I've run IEs, um, Richard does so. But now that I'm disengaged from it, I can say they're terrible. <laughs> um, it, unfortunately, because we've created these laws, we've created another problem, right? I mean, we have the laws we create have consequences. The consequences has been this independent expenditure um, law where outside groups, the only way they can participate in a meaningful way in an election, they feel is through IEs. We did it at the Labor Council with Labor. It's an effective tool as far as communicating um, with a broad number of people with the kind of constraints you have, like especially in the city elections with very low um, con contribution limits. And I, I don't know if it's, it can be misused, it can be used well, it can be hidden behind now, which is, I think, a bigger problem, the lack of transparency. Um, but, I, you know, I am not going to say we should get rid of contribution limits and go straight to that either. I, I'm not for that. I don't know what the answer is. Um, but they're, they're effective. Um, it doesn't give them, I don't believe, any excess power. I always like when people talk about how powerful people are. Um, again, at the UT editorial board, they asked me about how powerful CTA was, and I kind of laughed. I mean, the teachers' union... I guess, I guess I don't think of it that way. Everybody has power. They have power because guess what? They represent a whole lot of teachers in my district who are trying to educate a whole lot of the children in my district. So yeah, you know, of, of course I'm gonna talk to them about their issues. That, that power doesn't necessarily come from money. I think the power of people is much more important, um, but it, it, it's a system that was created because of campaign finance laws, which are kind of jacked. I, I, I would just, you know, it, it, what what Lorraine is saying is, is exactly right. But but here's, again, I, what I think is, is our reality. I think that I believe that the issues um, that I as an advocate care deeply about, and it's not always the case, but I believe that 
um, issues of working family, uh, working people being able to support their families. A strong public education system is broadly supported by most people in this community, in this state, and, and in this country. So because of that, I'd trade in a second the ability to raise lots of money to do an independent expenditure for a political system that was truly uh, fair and, and that, uh, and that uh, facilitated honest dialogue that led people, let people make thoughtful decisions because I think uh, a, a system through, uh, through which people make thoughtful decisions um, through honest dialogue is going to be then ref that the decisions coming out of that are going to be reflective of people's values, and in this situation, I think it's going to it's going to support the issues that that I care about. Um, but again, it's it's back to we we don't have a system like that right now, and so you you know you can't uh, you can't let the you know folks on the on the other side have all the power, and so we're going to engage you know under the under the rules as they exist. But I'd trade it in a second for a truly civil uh, you know political discourse in this country. Howard Dean was in town a couple of days ago, and Governor Dean uh, contended that Citizens United was the most dangerous U.S. Supreme Court decision since Dred Scott, in that it now basically says that corporate spending um, should be unbridled, unlimited, and has free speech rights, basically. Corporations are people, at least for that purpose. Um, I don't have a great problem with corporations spending as much money as unions spend. I have a problem when you don't know whose money it is. When you have groups, I had one group that opposed me in one election was called Now, which everybody assumed, I assume was National <laughs> Organization for Women. But it wasn't, it was National Organization for something that started with a W, I have no clue to this day what it was. And it was backed by the tobacco companies. Now, I don't mind if the tobacco companies say bad things about me, because I don't like them. But to have the tobacco companies say bad things about me and use the initials N-O-W as if it's now saying those things is just so corrupt, so j just not right. And, and that we need to fully disclose who's behind these, these ads, who's contributing. And when I say fully disclose, I mean all the way down to the original source of the money. Um, and that's what we're not doing. Great. So, so another quick plug for UCSD research, the, uh, the, the group that worked through Arizona campaign contribution laws to make uh, large contributions secretly uh, in the last election, when a, a UCSD graduate student has done a Public Records Act request for, for their list of donors and got, received one that was redacted, but not very well redacted, and so now has sort of charted who they are and where they are and compared them to the people who gave the money through sunlight. So, um, so we'll, we're going to see some interesting work coming out about that group. Um, anyone else want to address this, or should we go to our next audience question there. Great. So minding the separation of church and state, and not to put any of you on the spot, but someone said something that piqued my interest. Um, seems like throughout history and today, much of incivility is driven by religion. Are our religious leaders failing us today? My pope's not, but you know. I'm <laughs> hey, I want to be, uh, you give me the plug. Um, I was thinking about that earlier. We're talking about civility in, in the United States. I mean, we're all pretty civil. Well, what we do in this country to ourselves, but quite frankly, the wars that go on around the world that are largely based on religion are just, it's atrocious to think we're talking about civility, about how people talk about each other, and we're bombing people that invariably are innocent children, and, you know, I, there's a reason I'm not in Congress. Um, <laughs> But, you know, it, it's, it's a whole different level, right, when we talk about civility and life and death. I think that there are good religious leaders and bad religious leaders, you know. Um, I don't think they're good and bad religions for the most part, but obviously the leadership that um, I'm very proud of, and I, it's taken me years to say this, I'm very proud to be Catholic right now. You know, we have um, a, a pope who has really just gone out there and done some incredible things, and, and I'm hopeful that um, that he'll serve not only as light for Catholics and U.S. Catholics, but also for other other religions and other religious leaders. That there is a way to approach um, religion that can be much more embracive and, and conducive um, to a civil society worldwide. And I, I'm kind of proud of the pope. Anyone wanted to wade into these? Um, well, I, I wanted to talk about 
not necessarily religion, but spirituality in general. I, one of, when I was just kind of jotting notes about civility, just to kind of before this, uh, this group, one of the things that I ended with was love. And I think a lot of the problems that we have come down to that, loving each other and respecting each other as all members of human society. And you know, we share this little planet in this huge universe and all this fighting and all this arguing and name calling and all these things, yet we're just part of a human family and it comes down to loving each other and caring and really caring about each other, not just because what we would get out of it. So I think you know, our spiritual leaders or whether we have a spiritual leader or religion, I, re I think it really comes down to you know, how do we see ourselves? Do we respect ourselves enough? Do we love our neighbor as ourselves? And can we hear them, understand them? and work with them. And that, I thought, was the underlying part of the whole civility thing. And you know what I've kind of come to see as I've grown in the political circle, so to speak. And that's why you need more women in office. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had another question maybe in the, in the back row. It seems as though everyone who's in government is civil as people, you know, you guys have said that in all the other panels, that as individuals, everyone is civil. Um, yet the way that politics is portrayed in the media is really uncivil. Um, so I was wondering if you had any solution to that um, and any you know, reason why the media might portray politics as so uncivil if really what's going on up in Sacramento isn't that bad. Mm -hmm. um, I think they do because it sells newspapers or it you know, gets people to watch. It's that sound bite thing. Um, I, and it came up um, earlier about us as a society and individuals being able to think for ourselves and learn for ourselves. I'm always astonished when I watch those little news shows where they go around to a college campus or um, spring break or someplace and they ask people, Who's the vice president? And they can't say who they are. Or they show them a picture of someone, and they don't don't know who they are because folks are going around. They're not, you know, they're living life. They're they're not engaging even with in in the government or political realm where s these people are voting on things that affect their lives, and they're totally un unattached to that. So I think. There has to be some personal discipline as well. And I don't know, you know, I'm a mom. I try to encourage my son to think for himself and know what's going on. Um, one of the things my brother, who's a physician, had said to him, which I thought was really neat, if he would promise to watch the news for, you know, five minutes a day or read a newspaper and kind of different sources of news, not always the same ones. So you get different opinions and you kind of see what's going on. So as you become, he's 13 now, you know, into that more adult circle, you at least have an idea what's going on. Yes, there's a, there's a war going on in Israel. You know, there's, you know, issues around the world, Ebola and all these other things, and that we need to be cognizant of them and not just take what the media is showing us, you know, in these bullet, just little quips and think for ourselves and just say, okay, and I think Lorena touched on it, you know, are we going to accept that or are we going to independently question the authority or whatever it is that, you know, we're getting a source, so. Stealing again from Howard Dean, um, he was very optimistic. He said that if you look at Fox News and you look at MSNBC, the average viewership of Fox News is now 68 years old. <laughs> and the average viewership of MSNBC is 62 years old. So he, he was saying, you know, that kind of, that brand of politics and conflict is out the window. But then he talked about, so what do surveys show that young people, UCSD students are like, where do they get their news? And it's the Daily, Daily show. show and Colbert. So I'm not sure if that's better. It's different, but I'm not sure if it's better. Um, <laughs> now it's Instagram, right? It's not, <laughs> we're far beyond this. So. Anyway, Robbie. So 
I guess the simple answer that I'd like to provide is just that media is fueled by profits. And so when they profit off of making the legislature or any governing body look decisive, or divisive, I guess is the term, when there's two parties on each side, and that's what sells newspapers, that's what you know gets people to watch the news because that's what, what they want to see. But that's not what gets people out there to vote. And interestingly, I think one of the, the really big problems that I've seen is with a two-party system in this country, um, Political parties buy into that because when it's time for re-election, when you want people to pay attention, negative ads are run. And that, it sends the message that, you know, people who are watching these ads don't generally trust what they're hearing. For me, I, I don't uh, affiliate with either party. I'm uh, declined to state for my registration. But for me, uh, you know, I work 30 to 40 hours a week. On top of that, I'm a student. So for me, when I watch the news, when I hear about political issues, I don't trust what I'm hearing. And obviously, like I wouldn't be on a panel like this if I wasn't going to vote. But I know there's a lot of students out there who have a lot more on their plate than I do. And when they you know, have a general distrust from the system based on what they're fed by the media, um, they're not going to go out and vote. And it's, it's over for them because they don't care enough to look up information or they don't have the time to. And what they're being fed by the media is what sells it generates revenue for them. And I think it's unfortunate for a lot of governing bodies because it sends the message by the media that, you know, this body does not work efficiently. And maybe people shouldn't be as engaged in politics as they should be. Um, so I don't know if there's a solution. Or if there is a solution, it's not a practical solution. Well, so unfortunately, we have to wrap up this panel, which will not be on Fox or MSNBC or the 5 o'clock news because we are not properly bomb throwing. But there was a lot of, there was disagreement, there was interchange, there was, but importantly, there was, there was thoughtfulness. And so we, we, UCSD thanks you, all the panelists. Let's give them a round of applause for how open, honest, and civil they were. We'd like to thank uh, the, the audience for coming. And now we're having a, a chance for, for informal and, and, and civil uh, conversation around some free food in the back. So thank you guys all for coming to Ethics, Transparency, and Civility at UCSD.